Once we've successfully completed indexing and we have the dimensions of our unit cell, the next step is to assign the space group symmetry. I cannot overestimate how important this step is because if you choose the wrong space group, then everything you do in the analysis afterwards is going to be flawed. And there's no correcting for it other than to come back to this step and choose a different space group. Now when we look at single crystals and powders, as with many things, we have a few more options in the toolbox for a single crystal. But both with single crystals and with powders, probably the most important thing in determining the space group is the reflection conditions. And that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. So if we go back to some of the early lectures where we were talking about space group symmetry, we were talking about the international tables, there was a feature in the international tables that I kind of glossed over, which is the reflection conditions. Here we have a page from space group 14, the monoclinic space group P2 sub 1 over C, and we see that the reflection conditions are given here. And if we blow those up a little bit so we can see them more easily, what it says is H0L, L equal 2N. 0K0, K equal 2N. 00L, L equal 2N. And what this means is that any reflection which has indices H0 and L, that is any reflection where the K is a 0, the L parameter must be an even number. It must be a multiple of 2N. Any reflection that is a 0K0 reflection, that is where H and L are 0, the value of K must be an even number. And if it's not, that reflection is strictly forbidden and we will not see it. Okay, so that's the idea of the reflection conditions. I might just point out that we do see below here special reflection conditions that can go beyond what are called the general reflection conditions. These reflection conditions are only applicable if we have an atom at only that Wyckoff site. So if you had a crystal with P2 sub 1 upon C symmetry, and these are all the same for Wyckoff sites 2A through D, if you only had atoms on those Wyckoff sites, you would have this additional reflection condition. Most of the time we don't have an atom just on one Wyckoff site. So Normally, we can kind of ignore it, but there may be certain special occasions where you have additional reflection conditions that go above and beyond the general reflection conditions. So let's illustrate this with an example. Here is the powder diffraction pattern for selenium dioxide. If you look this compound up in the ICSD, you would see that it's an orthorhombic crystal, and the space group is PMC2 sub 1 and we have this kind of powder pattern. Now if we were to look more carefully at where the peaks are located and what their indices are, because if we've successfully done indexing and we have these parameters for A, B, and C, we can assign HKL values to each peak. And when we do that, we get this list of peaks. These are the first 21 peaks. And when we look in the international tables for this space group, we see that the reflection conditions are H0L, L equal 2N. So for the H0L reflections, L must be an even number. And for the 00L reflections, L must be an even number. So we can look at our list of observed diffraction peaks. And let's focus now just on those that fall into these two categories. And so if we do that, we see that, in fact, only five of the first 21 peaks would be one of these two categories. For the H0L peaks, you know, we have a 102 peak, and we have a 200 peak, we have a 202 peak, right? Those all have K equal to zero. And for the 00L reflections, we have a 002 and a 004. And if you just look at it for a minute, you would see that the reflection conditions are obeyed. It's easy to see for the 00L peaks that we see only ones where L is an even number, the 2 and then the 4. And for the H0L peaks, also we see only those where 
the L parameter, the third index, is even. I might also note that 002 and 004, they do fall under the H0L condition as well. Right? They also have k equal to 0, but they don't violate either condition. Okay, So we can just simply see that in the powder diffraction pattern of SeO2, the reflection conditions are met. Now that means that some peaks must be missing, and of course, you know, it's hard to say where those peaks are if they're missing, but given the unit cell parameters, we could calculate where all of the peaks up to about 50 degrees are located, or would be located, for these two classes of reflections. And if we do that, we see that, yes, indeed, the 101, the 201, the 103, those are three different HKL reflection indices where k is zero, and in all cases l is an odd number, and we don't see those. We can also see that the 100 peak, which is allowed because l is zero, which is an even number, that's missing. And that points out that sometimes the details of the crystal structure are such that some peaks are so weak that we won't see them. The 100 peak is not forbidden in this space group. But in this particular crystal structure, it's so weak that we don't see it in the powder diffraction pattern. If we look over here to the 00L reflections, we see that, yeah, we scanned out to a high enough angle where we would have seen the 001 and the 003, but they're missing. This is what we mean when we talk about the reflection conditions. I might just point out that an analogous term that's often used would be systematic absences. So we could talk about the peaks that are missing, that would be the systematic absences, or the peaks that are observed, and those would be the reflection conditions. Now, what's causing these peaks to be missing? It turns out that they're associated with certain elements of symmetry. The H0L peaks that are missing in the space group are missing because there's a C glide plane perpendicular to B, right? PMC 2 sub 1. And the 00L peaks that are missing are missing because there's a 2 sub 1 screw axis parallel to C. And so we might ask the question, do all of the symmetry elements lead to some missing reflections? And therefore, by analyzing the missing reflections, we can work out exactly what symmetry elements are present and which are not. The answer is not so much. The only symmetry elements that lead to systematic absences or specific reflection conditions are those that have a translational symmetry component. So that means all kinds of lattice centering, face centering, body centering, base centering, those all lead to certain systematic absences. And then the travel symmetry operations, the screw axes and the glide planes, those have a translational component to them. And both of those types of symmetry elements lead to missing reflections. But there are other symmetry elements like mirror planes, proper rotation axes, improper rotation axes, inversion centers. Those kinds of symmetry elements do not produce any systematic absences. So by looking at the peaks that are missing, we cannot say anything definitive about whether those symmetry elements are present or not. Now we can be a little more systematic uh, pun intended, about the relationship between which peaks are missing and the specific symmetry elements. So let's start with the lattice centering. That's the most important one generally, and that's usually where we would start in an analysis. And so if we were to look at, let's say, base centering. Base centering where the centered base is the C face of the unit cell. That's perpendicular to the C axis. In that case, the only peaks that we're going to see are those where H plus K is an even number. 110, 221, 134. Those are all examples where H plus K equals an even number. The value of L here is irrelevant. If we look at a body-centered lattice, we see that when we add all three Miller indices together, we have to get an even number. If we look at a face-centered lattice, we see a kind of special condition which says that Either H, K, and L all have to be odd numbers, like 111 or 311, 
or they all have to be even numbers like 222. Two, two. But we would not see a peak like 211 because that's a mixture of odd and even numbers. And then for the rhombohedral unit cell, we have this condition that the difference between H and K plus L has to be a multiple of 3N. These systematic absences or reflection conditions affect every peak in the pattern. Those that are associated with the travel symmetry operations, however, are limited to certain classes of reflections. So if we look at the absences associated with screw axes, let's just start with the 2 sub 1 screw axis. If the 2 sub 1 screw axis is parallel to A, that's going to affect which peaks we see amongst only the H00 peaks. And the condition for a 2 sub 1 screw axis is that we're only going to see those peaks when H is an even number. It turns out that that's exactly the same absences for a 4 sub 2 screw axis or for a 6 sub 3 screw axis. If we change the orientation of the screw axis, let's make our 2 sub 1 screw axis now parallel to B. We have the same kind of condition, but now it affects the 0k0 zero peaks because the axis is oriented parallel to B. If we have a screw axis 2 sub 1 or 4 sub 2 parallel to C, then we see it affects the 0, 0, L reflections. And once again, L has to be 2N. And when we have screw axes where the subscript divided by the base number is not 1 half, then we're going to have a somewhat different conditions. Instead of a 4 sub 2 screw axis, if we have a 4 sub 1 screw axis parallel to A, it still affects the H00 reflections, but now we only see peaks where H is a multiple of 4. So we would only see the 400, zero, the 800, zero, the 1200. Zero. And once again, if we change the orientation of that axis, the peaks that are affected become 0K0 zero when it's parallel to B, 00L zero zero when it's parallel to C. If we talk about threefold or sixfold screw axes, we have a similar kind of consideration. Remember that these axes, generally, we only see them when they are parallel to the C axis. So let's just look at that case. If you have a 3 sub 1 or a 3 sub 2 screw parallel to C, then you only see 0, 0, L peaks where L is a multiple of 3. We have the same conditions for a 6 sub 2 or a 6 sub 4 screw axis. And finally, if we have either a 6 sub 1 or a 6 sub 5 screw axis, we only see the 0, 0, L reflections where L is a multiple of 6. The glide planes impact a different kind of reflection. If the glide plane is perpendicular to a given crystallographic axis, let's say the glide plane is perpendicular to A, the peaks that are affected are those where the H parameter, remember H goes with A, is going to be 0. So that's the 0 KL reflections. So if you have a certain set of systematic absences that go with the 0 KL reflections, that tells you you have a glide plane perpendicular to A. Now what kind of glide depends on the details of the reflection condition. If it's a B glide, then the K parameter must be an even number. If it's a C glide, the L parameter must be an even number. If it's a diagonal or N glide, K plus L must be an even number. And if it's a diamond glide, then K plus L must be a multiple of 4. So those are the conditions for glide planes. If we change the orientation of the glide plane, for example, perpendicular to B, then the peaks that are affected are the H0L. Perpendicular to C, the peaks that are affected are the HK0 peaks. All right, so these are the kinds of absences we see for glide planes. Now, when you think about those conditions we just talked about, it sounds rather straightforward to look at which peaks are missing and say, oh, here's a glide plane, here's a screw axis, you know, here's a lattice centering. But sometimes you can have a situation where 
the absences that are imposed by one or more symmetry elements make it look like a symmetry element is there, but it's really not. So let's go back to our example of selenium dioxide. What we saw from the international tables and from our analysis of the peaks is the peaks that are missing are H0L, when L is not an even number, and 00L, when L is not an even number. And so the first condition suggests, okay, we have a C glide perpendicular to B, and the second condition suggests we have a two sub one screw axis parallel to C. How would our absences change if we were to remove the screw axis? Well, you know, this first condition wouldn't change. And you would think then that we might start to see all the 00L peaks. We might see 001, 003, 005. However, the 00L peaks are a subset of the H0L peaks. And for the H0L peaks, L has to be an even number. So even though there's no screw axis, we're still not going to see the 001 or the 003. And so this is a case where it can be a little tricky to look at the absences and determine exactly which symmetry elements are present. It turns out that if you have these reflection conditions, there are three possible space groups. PMC 2 sub 1, that's the space group we saw for selenium dioxide, but also P2CM and PMCM. These space groups all have different symmetries. The commonality is they all have a C glide, but only the first has a 2 sub 1 screw axis. Okay, so because of this kind of ambiguity, it's best if we use tables that we can find in the international tables for crystallography. So if you go to the front part of the book and look at section 1.6.4, there are tables of reflection conditions and possible space groups for every crystal system. So what I show here is a portion of the table for an orthorhombic crystal. And how we would read this is we have to divide the reflections into different categories and then see what might be missing. For orthorhombic systems, we divide them into these seven categories. HKL, that would be each and every reflection in the pattern. Right? That's going to tell us about the lattice centering or lack of lattice centering. 0KL, H0L, and HK0. Those can tell us about glide planes. And then H00, 0K0, and 00L. And those tell us about screw axes. We look at each of these categories of reflections and see if there's a pattern to the peaks that are present and those that are absent. And then we would come down in this table and find something that matches that. So where we see an H, that tells us that H must be an even number. Where we see a K, that tells us that K must be an even number. H plus K means that the sum of H plus K must be an even number. And sometimes, although we don't see it here, we might have H comma K. That tells us both H and K must be even numbers. And then we can have also things like 2H plus L equals 4N. So that tells us that 2 times H index plus the L index must be a multiple of 4. Once you've identified the row that has the systematic absences or reflection conditions that match your pattern, you just read it across and it tells you all of the possible space groups. And I have to say, oftentimes these are not unique. So if we were on this row right here, it would tell us that, okay, we've got a C glide and an A glide. So that could be P2 sub 1 CA or PMCA. And based on the reflection conditions, we can't tell the difference between these two. We have to use other approaches to differentiate between the two of them. All right, let's do an example where we have indexed our powder pattern and we know the crystal system and now we're trying to determine the unit cell. This is the x-ray powder pattern for the anatase form of TiO2. Uh, it's a tetragonal unit cell with these parameters. And at the end of the indexing, we would have been able to assign Miller indices to each and every peak in the diffraction pattern. So here I show the peaks out to 75 degrees 2 theta. 
Well, let's put all of those peaks into a table. And now looking at their Miller indices, we want to sort them into these different groups. Now we always want to start by looking at the general HKL reflection conditions because those tell us about the lattice centering. And if you look at these numbers for a little while, you could see that hmm, everywhere H plus K plus L adds up to an even number. We have odd numbers in all of the different positions. And we have mixtures of even and odd, like 211 or 213. But everywhere the sum of the three is an even number. And that tells us that we have a body-centered lattice. So we know that we're dealing with a body-centered tetragonal space group. Now let's go through these other conditions. Right? These are the conditions that we look at when we're sorting a tetragonal crystal. First, let's look at the HK0 reflections. And amongst the list of reflections that we have indexed, we see there's only two where the L parameter is zero. There's a 200 zero and a 220. Well, this could mean that H plus K is an even number, or H is an even number, or K is an even number. The most restrictive condition that we can come up with is H and K are even numbers. Right? We don't see the 1, 1, 0. We don't see the 1, 0, 0. So we're going to go with this as our reflection condition for the HK0 peaks. Then let's go on to the 0KL peaks. And this is a point where it might be just a little confusing. Because if you look at this, we don't seem to have any 0KL peaks. But remember, in a tetragonal space group, A and B are equivalent, which means that the despacing for... Uh, a 0KL peak is exactly the same as the despacing for an H0L peak. They would be on top of each other. So we can put into this category all of the peaks where there's a 0 in one of the first two positions. And that's going to be the 101, the 103, the 105, the 204, and the 107. Well, right away, you can see that you know we have odd numbers in here. And we have even numbers sometimes, like 204. But in every case, the sum of H plus L, actually it says H plus K, it should be H plus L, is an even number. What about the HHL peaks, where the first two indices are equal, and then we have a different third index? Well, you know, there are only three of those peaks, 004, 112, 116. You know, we see a couple of things. The, the L's are always even numbers here. If the L is always an even number, then that means because it's body-centered and H plus K plus L has to be an even number, it means that the first two numbers either have to both be even or both odd. But if you look in the international tables, there are a variety of conditions that go with this particular class of reflections, and one of them is 2H plus L equals a multiple of 4. And that's true here. 2 times 0 plus 4 is 4. 2 times 1 plus 2, that's 4. 2 times 1 plus 6, that's 8. And those are all multiples of 4. And then we might note that the 114 peak is missing. That would satisfy less stringent reflection conditions. And so we're going to go with this as our criterion for the HHL peaks. We see only one 00L peak, the 004. And that means that the 001, 002, and 003 are all missing. So the reflection condition here is L equal 4N. If we look at the H00 peaks, we see only one of those as well, the 200. I think we maybe don't get out high enough an angle that we might see the 300 or the 400. But definitely the 100 is missing. So we're going to call this reflection condition, the H equal 2N. And then finally, the HH0 peaks. We only have one of those as well, uh, and that is the 220. So we're going to say that's also H equal 2N. Right, we don't see the 110, for example. With this set of reflection conditions, if you go to those tables that you can find in the International Tables for Crystallography, we would see that these reflection conditions uniquely identify the space group as I4 sub 1 over AMD. And that is the space group for anatase. 
And some of the symmetry elements that are present, we can recognize them pretty easily from the reflection conditions. You know, the body-centered one we figured out from the HKL reflections. This four sub one screw axis, which is going to be parallel to C, right? That's why the zero zero L peaks are only present when L is a multiple of four. The A glide, which is perpendicular to the C axis, is going to affect the HK zero peaks right here. And the A glide would mean that the HK zero peaks, H has to be an even number. But because of the tetragonal symmetry, the A and B axes are equivalent. So that means that the K must also be an even number. And so this reflection condition here tells us about the A glide. And then the diamond glide here is the last one that gives us absences. Note that the diamond glide is actually perpendicular to the face diagonal, perpendicular to the 110 direction. So it's not quite so easy to interpret it, but that's why we look at these HHL peaks and we find this reflection condition. Right? If this condition were not here, if we only specified that you know, L must be an even number, that wouldn't be a diamond glide, and then the space group would be I4 sub 1 over A. Right? So this is how we can use the reflection conditions to make a space group assignment. This is not the normal case that we can uniquely identify the space group. Oftentimes, we can only narrow it down to a handful. But in general, we can narrow it down to a number that's five or fewer, 